counting the cost of a night of destruction. Confidential court papers found on a council tip. Why nurses can't even prescribe bandages for patients. And a Christmas decoration that could burn your house down. Hello, good evening. People in Andover are still counting the cost of a four-hour siege in which shops were burnt out, vehicles wrecked and the emergency services pelted with missiles. At one stage, nearly a hundred police and firemen were at the scene. Tonight, four businesses are in ruins, their owners wondering whether they can survive into the new year. Two men are still being questioned by Hampshire police. Peter Henley has this report. It was more like Belfast than Andover. Police, fire and ambulance men, lucky to escape uninjured, forced to take cover as their vehicles were wrecked by a hail of heavy masonry from the roof 50 feet up. The fire burned out of control for nearly five hours through shops and offices. Staff arriving for work could hardly believe the devastation. It all began at 2 a.m. with reports of a break-in. Two men were on the roof and the emergency services couldn't get close because they were being pelted with heavy coping stones. The fire brigade were forced to withdraw. Riot police moved in and trained negotiators tried to speak to the men. Residents were told to stay indoors. I saw one of them through the skylight. He poked his tongue out at me. I hope it did him some pleasure. But I'd like to have sorted him out myself. I had a broom handle in my hand, and if I got the chance, I'd have given him a wallet, I tell you. But the fire service had to be helped into the premises, and fighting the fire became extremely difficult because every time we tried to get off fire officers in to fight the fire, um, they came under fire. So we ended up using shields and making a tortoise-like affair to actually get them in to, um, to do the business. At dawn, the men gave themselves up. The 17 and 21-year-old from Fleet were brought down and taken for questioning. But for shop owners, a black day was only just beginning. With four businesses burned out, some estimates put the cost of the damage as high as a million pounds. Michael Miles, an accountant, found little to salvage from 29 years of work. Yeah, I had no idea it was like this. You know, one of my staff rang me earlier on this morning and said, oh, there's a fire, come down and have a look. And, um, you know, it, it is absolutely incredible. In their four hours on the roof, the men caused thousands of pounds worth of damage. The ambulance alone will cost more than £40,000 to replace. I'm absolutely appalled that anyone would destroy an ambulance service vehicle which is there to protect the public. The shop roofs had been systematically stripped of anything heavy. Tons of masonry had been rained down. Coping stones, ridge tiles, anything that was to hand was hurled to the ground. As the clearing up operation began, the mayor of Andover reflected on the cost to the community. One of the things that we're very concerned about is that a lot of these shops can survive into the new year and stay open because we want, to, we want a buoyant shopping centre and this is a terrible blow for us. Tonight, the two men arrested on the roof are still being questioned. As more than 100 fire and police officers wearily made their way home, insurance assessors were working out just how much it will cost to put right the damage caused in four hours. Peter Henley, Coast to Coast, Andover. Legal documents including the names and addresses of defendants and witnesses, details of criminal records and photos of murder victims had been found on a council tip in Brighton. The police are now looking into how sensitive material provided to defence solicitors came to be dumped without being shredded first. Alan Clark reports. The documents were found at the Sheepcote Valley Household Waste Site. A man who didn't want to be identified contacted Coast to Coast and showed us sensitive legal papers which he found while dumping rubbish at the site. They include police interviews, solicitors' letters, witness statements and probation service reports. Some of the material is highly sensitive. One document about a man facing serious charges describes how his two stepdaughters had been sexually abused by relatives. The material handed to us came from four places. Brighton Police Station, the Law Courts in Lansdowne Road, Hove, the East Sussex Probation Service and a firm of solicitors in the lanes in Brighton. At a news conference this afternoon, police officers said they were deeply concerned that prosecution files passed to defence solicitors had been found on a tip. Four sack loads have now been recovered. Clearly this is material which identifies people as victims of crime, it identifies people as offenders in criminal cases, 
There are photographs, even one album of post-mortem photographs, all of which is highly confidential and clearly shouldn't turn up in circumstances such as these. No one was available for comment at the firm of solicitors mentioned in some of the documents. Police say this case is a clear breach of confidentiality and is notable for the sheer quantity of material which has turned up on a public tip. They believe most of the documents have now been recovered. But police are still trying to trace a number of missing post-mortem photographs of the victims of crime. It's feared they could be destined for obscene publications. Alan Clark, Coast to Coast, Brighton. Police and gas board officials are still investigating the deaths of a Sussex couple who were suffocated by carbon monoxide fumes. They are re-examining a gas boiler which they've already checked once and said was functioning perfectly. Natalie Gray sends this report. Police and gas board officials were back at the scene of the tragedy today in a final bid to discover what went wrong. Charlotte Turtle, a 20-year-old dental nurse, and her boyfriend, golf professional Paul Hurring, died in their sleep from carbon monoxide poisoning. British Gas say they could find nothing wrong with gas installations at the cottage in Horsham when they carried out initial tests on Sunday after the bodies were found. However, they returned to the scene today with police to re-examine a gas boiler and flue. British Gas are refusing to comment until after inquests have taken place. But the Gas Consumer Council has its theories about the tragedy. Well, I would guess that probably the, com the products of combustion have not escaped properly up the flue and that could have been brought about by having a poorly maintained boiler perhaps inadequate ventilation. Somehow or other, the carbon monoxide has got back into the room rather than going up the flue as it should. However, the tragedy may have been caused by freak weather conditions. If the weather is still and cold, there is, not, there is a chance that the products of combustion do not escape. The house had been empty for 18 months prior to Charlotte and her mother moving in a week ago. That too may have played a part. The message is to get all gas appliances regularly serviced and properly maintained. Meanwhile, it's emerged that Paul Hurring and Charlotte Turtle had planned to marry, even though they only met six weeks ago. They'll now be buried side by side at a funeral on Tuesday. Natalie Gray, Coast to Coast, Horsham. Nurses should be allowed to issue prescriptions to patients, according to the Isle of Wight MP Barry Field. He says some patients in his constituency wait for days for medicines and dressings which visiting nurses could issue on the spot. But a law to speed up the system has been delayed to save money. Mark Bishop sends this report from the Isle of Wight. District nurse Jane Salter sets off from her health clinic in Ryde on her daily round. This morning she's visiting a patient who lives in Nettlestone. Much of Jane's work involves treating patients who need a regular change of bandages. But under current legislation, she and thousands of other nurses can't even issue a prescription for them. It has to come from the local GP. Double amputee Ken Saunders needs constant care and attention. But the current system is cumbersome and is causing unnecessary delay in administering treatment. But after legislation was passed to give nurses the right to make out their own prescriptions, it's now been shelved. It's time consuming for the district nurses. Um, because if we were able to prescribe our own dressings, we could actually do it in the patient's home, give them the prescription, and then all they had to do was go to the chemist. The government has put the system on hold to save £17 million from this year's health budget. Isle of Wight MP Barry Field is incensed. In a letter to Health Minister Dr Brian Mawinney, he says, I'm very concerned about this delay because so many ambulance crews have been trained to administer drugs to patients on their way to hospital. It must make sense to allow nurses to write routine prescriptions for their patients, which would release busy doctors to get on with diagnosing the really difficult problems. At the moment, whenever Ken Saunders needs new bandages, a new prescription needs to be issued. He says the system needs changing. We have to go to the post office, and then it has to go to the chemist, and it's two or three days before we get it. 28,000 nurses would be affected under the new legislation. For Jane Salter, the sooner it comes into force, the better. Mark Bishop, Coast to Coast, on the Isle of Wight. Now, a roundup of the rest of the day's news from your part of the TVS region. Good evening. Thieves have escaped with thousands of pounds worth of Christmas drink, toys, and clothing following a series of violent break ins on shops in the Thames Valley. There were two attacks in Reading and a third in Henley. On each occasion, the men responsible smashed their way in with sledgehammers. Chris Wilson reports. 
Three masked men wielding sledgehammers were caught on a security video camera as they smashed their way into Thresher's off-license here in Woodley just after 2.30 this morning. Having broken down the door, they escaped with whiskey, two crates of lager, wine and cigarettes. Earlier in the night, there was a similar raid on this toy shop in Tilehurst. It was broken into shortly after midnight. Thieves there got away with a haul which included expensive remote control cars. They made their getaway in an Austin Princess, which was later found abandoned nearby. The third break-in was on this sports shop in Henley. Again, thieves smashed their way in. They took 80 ski suits worth up to £300 apiece. Two masked men were spotted leaving the scene in a dark-coloured car. It's not known whether or not the attacks are linked, but detectives say in all three cases the men involved were armed and dangerous. They're advising members of the public not to tackle the thieves if they strike again. Chris Wilson, Coast to Coast, Reading. Hooded armed raiders followed a market trader for more than 200 miles from Blackbush Market at Yately to Ashbourne in Derbyshire before hijacking his car. The 38-year-old victim was forced out and attacked with an iron bar. The thieves escaped with £15,000 in cash and cheques. Interpol have been called in to search for a Berkshire teenager who vanished nearly a month ago. Nadia Zaiden, who's 16, was living in Newbury, where she'd been placed in care. It's thought she could have gone to Cairo to see her father. Police say Nadia has run away several times before. More than 50 workers are facing a bleak Christmas after being sacked for going on strike. The staff from Reading engineering firm E. Hillier & Son were dismissed for stopping work in protest at contracts which cut wages by up to 40%. Some have joined a picket line outside the Cardiff Road Works. Unions say a further 40 staff at the aircraft industry contractor have been laid off during the last few weeks. Police are looking for thieves who broke into a plant hire company at Reading and stole £40,000 worth of tools and generators. The gang deactivated the alarm system at PB plant hire in Commercial Road by filling the box with foam. They then forced their way into the premises by breaking down a rear fire door. A 79-year-old man is fighting for his life after he was struck by a bus luggage flap at Burfield near Reading. Stanley Bryant was thrown headfirst onto the pavement and is believed to have suffered a fractured skull. He is said to be in a poorly condition in hospital. The bus is being examined by accident investigators. That's all from me. Now return to the Coast to Coast studio and back to Mai. Well, coming up a little later on the programme, Carl Tyler, with a dry forecast. Cool. You've got to say it to believe it. <laughs> Plus, after 100 years of football, will the Seagulls decide tonight to sell the Goldstone ground? And how the taxman got it wrong in Dorset, but taxpayers get a little bonus for Christmas. But first, as Christmas shopping begins in earnest, Trading Standards officers are warning of two gifts that are serious fire hazards. One is an adapter that can catch fire when it's plugged in. The other is a Christmas tree candle that sends the tree up in flames. Sean Holden reports. If you go in for an old-fashioned Christmas with candles on the tree, you run the old-fashioned risks. The speed at which disaster could take hold seems obvious, but candles like this, designed for Christmas trees, are on sale in West Sussex shops. It's now only 20 seconds since this one was lit. Trading standards officers say this tradition brand of candles from Germany, with their little clips for the tree branches, could be the heralds of death and destruction on Christmas morning. We were aghast to see them on sale because really it is quite a silly idea to actually market something which is a, a candle designed to be fitted into a hole and clipped onto a live tree and lit. We think that's really quite dangerous. The candles were discovered in a Sussex garden centre and sales have now been suspended. Firemen find it incredible that they were ever on sale in the first place. To put a lighted candle on a Christmas tree is almost suicidal. It's a disaster waiting to happen. While West Sussex officials try to track down the import lists to withdraw other candles, a less spectacular but no less dangerous Christmas fire hazard is being confiscated by their colleagues in Dorset. This electrical adapter used for toys and cassette recorders could be lethal. Despite its claims, the Chinese import doesn't meet British safety standards. But hundreds of them have already been sold from shops in Dorset. There's a setting on it for setting the voltage put into a toy or a plants or whatever and the actual voltage going into the toy can be 
double that actually indicated, which can cause problems, obviously, potential damage to the toy even. Uh, the other thing is there's a risk of short-circuiting the terminals, if I call them those. And in that case, in an extreme situation, there's a potential fire hazard. 200 adapters have been sold in three G&T warehouse shops in Dorset. They withdrew them after being contacted by trading standards officers. They warned us that they are possibly a potential hazard, so we've uh, advertised quite extensively to have any that we've sold to be returned and, and to collect a full refund. In spite of the warning, only 15 have been returned. The Christmas message from safety experts is, if you've got one, don't use it. And keep candles well away from your tree. Sean Holden, Coast to Coast. Well, now, if you're a football fan and you support Brighton, Pompey, Saints, Reading and Bournemouth, stay tuned. The next spot is for you. If not, and you're a tennis fan, stay tuned. If none of those things interest you, stay tuned for that rarity, a dry Tyler. Before that, though, <laughs> David Bogan. Yeah, it's the football we're going to start with. The board of Brighton Football Club are meeting at this very moment to consider a rescue package that could well determine the future survival of the club. Local property developers have offered to buy the Goldstone ground and the bid comes just eight days before the club faces a winding up order in the High Court. Jeremy Pierce now reports. It's been Brighton's home for almost a century, but tonight the club could agree to sell the Goldstone ground to safeguard their future. Property developer John Farmer is the man behind the latest rescue package. His company, the Wincote Group, are thought to have offered Brighton a down payment of a million pounds. Now it's up to the board. Our major role was to try and allow the club to extract as much value as possible from the existing site to put into a new stadium, to put into the pot, as it were. Now, here we've been faced with a rather more urgent requirement because the revenue are banging on the door and there's a High Court writ to be heard next week. So we've had to respond very quickly in the current climate. The deal depends on Brighton receiving planning permission to redevelop the ground. If the council give the go-ahead on January the 7th, the Goldstone's future will be as a retail park. Brighton will get their financial lifeline and be given almost three years to find a new stadium. We've put the best and most fullest offer we can forward uh, for the benefit of the club because we want them to survive, we want them to put cash into the new stadium as well. No point at this stage leaving them short because we're going to win a, a battle perhaps and lose the ball. The deal could strengthen Brighton's case in the High Court next week when they face that winding up order from the Inland Revenue. They're thought to owe £400,000 and the Revenue are liable to want an immediate payment. The sale of the Goldstone ground looks to be the key to the club's survival. Jeremy Pierce, Coast to Coast. A little further down the coast, Portsmouth are poised to sign the Manchester City Welsh international goalkeeper Andy Dibble. The 27-year-old keeper is expected to join Pompey on loan with a view to a £350,000 transfer. Now that proposed transfer puts a question mark over the future of Alan Knight. Knight, who's 31, has been at Fratton Park for 15 years and in that time has played more than 400 league games for the club. Well, Portsmouth will be without three players for tonight's Anglo-Italian Cup game against Lucchese at Fratton Park. Steve Agnew and Ray Daniel are both injured and Warren Neal is unwell. That match kicks off at 7.45. Meanwhile, the Southampton striker Paul Moody has joined Reading on a month's loan. Moody's played only five full games for the Saints since he signed for Waterlooville for £50,000 last season. He's been signed as cover for Jimmy Quinn, who starts a three-match suspension on Saturday. And Steve Lovell has been released by Bournemouth after only five matches. He scored just one goal since his arrival from Gillingham. On now to that tennis, and Hampshire's Chris Wilkinson will lead Britain into tomorrow's European Team Championships as the country's number one player for the very first time. Wilkinson takes over from Jeremy Bates, who's had to drop out of the tournament in Italy because of illness. The championships are being played on a knockout basis for the first time, and Britain face a tough challenge keeping their place in the elite championship division. So well done to Chris. We wish them luck. That's it. Back to Mai. Thank you very much, David. Well, thousands of people in Dorset are about to get an unexpected Christmas bonus. Not from their boss. This time it's from the tax man. Yes, it's revenge. And it's because many companies have had problems working out new POYE regulations. Malcolm Shaw explains. It's a little bit of seasonal cheer, and it comes courtesy of the tax man. A refund of £65 in time for Christmas. The Inland Revenue here in Bournemouth discovered that many small firms have been taking too much tax from their workers, so now they're giving it back. Accountants Touche Ross have been studying how much is owed to how many. 
when the Inland Revenue first picked this up, they carried out a confidential survey, and the results of that survey, based on a sample they took, they estimated that there could be up to 20% of businesses employing 50 people or less that are affected. What that could mean in the Bournemouth and Poole area alone is that some 10,000 employees could have paid too much tax. These are the tax tables that firms have to wade through. Hidden away at the back, new allowances announced at the last budget. It's not hard to see why they've been overlooked. It's small employers like hotels that have fallen into the trap and overtaxed their staff. Here at the Bournemouth International, Juliet Steele is in charge of the payroll. In fact, she's been getting her sums right, but understands why others haven't. I did look very carefully at the new tax tables and the first week that it applied I phoned up my local tax office and actually got them to go through it with me while I was doing the wages so it was a great help and it set a standard so I knew I'd got it right and uh, you can follow on from then. So no £65 bonus for no, people here? No, unfortunately not, they've had it already. The rebates could mean more than half a million pounds for people to spend in the run up to Christmas. Very nice. If I, believe, if I can believe yeah. me, that is. <laughs> what do you think you'll spend it on? Christmas presents, I guess. Be quite good, really, because I'm. I do get short of money this sort of time of year. Be very welcome. So Christmas has come early in Dorset, and it's the dreaded taxman who's playing Santa. Malcolm Shaw, coast to coast. Taxman playing Santa. Oh, wait till the New Year. No rain. No wind. No storms. What's Carl Tyler going to do? I know, he must be bored. He'll find something. You wait and see, <laughs> viewers. How about a bit of frost, a bit of yes. fog? Why not, eh? I thought not so. Not yet, but let, let's let this water soak in at the moment. Yes. So the next rain, probably late Friday? Yes. And not too much of it. And anything else horrible? A bit of frost, but I thought you know, it's that time of year, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, go on, <laughs> fill in the details. We're certainly absolutely marvellous today. We had the sunshine. Well, certainly most of us, it's been a dry day, and even the roads have dried out. I think it's the first time I've seen those roads dry for about a couple of weeks. But there are problems tonight, and we can see this on the satellite picture. Now, to start with, we've got a band of cloud lying down the eastern side of the country over Sussex and Surrey. There's more cloud in over Wales, but down the middle there is a strip where it's absolutely clear, and that's where we're going to get our lowest temperatures tonight. Now, on the overall weather pattern, the cloud out over Ireland, that's the frontal system. There's a fair drop of rain with it at the moment. That's moving slowly in towards us. But by noon tomorrow, it's all changed. The front's getting very close, then starting to move away. We've got high pressure building on either side of the front. It's killing the rain out, and I think a lot of the cloud by the end of the afternoon. So, yeah, there'll be a fair amount of cloud around tomorrow, but dry and bright. Tonight, first thing is it's going to be dry right the way through the night, and Sussex and Surrey probably staying fairly cloudy, so their temperature's down to about 3, that's 37 degrees Fahrenheit. Further west, Wiltshire and Dorset will see some cloud coming in late in the night, so temperatures there, 0 to plus 1, you're round the freezing mark. But it's this slot in the middle, North Hampshire, Berkshire, up in towards Oxford, where temperatures could go, minus 1, 30 degrees Fahrenheit, so a local air frost there, widespread ground frost, in that slot there, perhaps some icy patches on the roads, and there may even be one or two fog patches around, so quite a mixed bunch tonight. And then tomorrow morning, any fog will go quite quickly, dry and bright, still rather cloudy over Sussex and Surrey, patchy cloud works here in Dorset, and we'll luck some hazy sunshine in between. As we come into the afternoon, we're going to find the cloud in, Wilks, uh, in Sussex and Surrey perhaps moving in towards eastern Hampshire, but Wilkshire and Dorset brightening up with hazy sunshine. Now, the winds are just a light northeasterly, but we could just about see a force four late in the afternoon mid-channel. Your temperatures tomorrow? A rather cold seven, that's 45, and that northeasterly wind a bit on the biting side. Now, looking ahead for the next two or three days, Thursday fog could be a problem until middle late morning, then brightening up with some sunshine to finish the day. Friday again, we could start out with some fog brightening up, then clouding over some rain late in the day. Then Saturday, a rather cloudy day with some morning rain. Our picture tonight, that's by Kayleigh Brown. In the summary tonight, dry with a ground frost tomorrow, dry, bright, and cold. Thank you, Carl. And before we leave you a look at the main headlines in the South tonight, shops are burnt out, vehicles wrecked and the emergency services pelted with missiles in a four-hour siege in Andover. Legal documents, including details of criminal records and photos of murder victims, have been found on a tip in Brighton. And gas board officials are still investigating the deaths of a Sussex couple suffocated by carbon monoxide fumes. And some late news. Thousands of rail commuters travelling from Waterloo, Victoria, Charing Cross and Waterloo East stations in London...
face delays tonight because of a major security alert. All the stations have been evacuated and they'll be closed until at least 7 o'clock. So if you are expecting someone home about this time, they're going to be rather late. Let's hope everybody gets home safely. Don't forget the late news tonight. We'll bring you all the details at 10.30 with Debbie Middleton and we'll be back tomorrow. See you then. Good night. Good night. videos scrapbook for the south and scrapbook for the southeast and the funniest animal and pet stories we've ever broadcast are in it shouldn't happen to a pet they're nine pounds 99 each from tvs coast to coast videos p.o box 123 southampton so 97 hh for more details call 0891 300 722 in a few moments here on TVS, our Tuesday evening begins with Bob Holness introducing Blockbusters after the break. If you can't use this diary, alarm, address book, calculator and word processor in five minutes, you'll get your money back. Just £199.99, the new notepad computer from Amstrad. Is your big box powder fading your colours? Now there's totally new Daz colour to help keep colours brighter for longer. I've used my powder for years, the colour's fine. Try new Daz colour, you'll see the difference. No, thank you. I'm quite happy with my own. I'll tell you now, it certainly opened my eyes. Absolutely incredible, the colours. These are some of Sam's shorts. I've washed those quite a bit since I've had this uh, new Daz colour. And the colours obviously come out exceptionally well. All the grime came out and everything. I just can't get over it. These were the shorts I bought last year. You can obviously see how they faded in the elastic. I've always used that powder that my mum used. I never thought to change. I can't believe I've been so blind for so long. Please, let's test your loyalty here then. Here's two big packs of your old powder for your one Daz. Uh, no, 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 I'll take this one. You're not yes. gonna upset your mum, you know? I know, I know I am. <laughs> well, mind you, I'll be able to convert her to start using Daz colour, might not I? New Daz colour. See the difference, and you won't swap. I demand more, even from an aftershave. Here's one that smells great and takes care of my skin. Old Spice Hydrogel. It's an aftershave and moisturiser in one, forming an amazing new gel. Light, easily absorbed. Refreshing. It smells great and leaves my skin feeling incredibly smooth. Does your aftershave do that? New Old Spice Hydrogel, the freshest idea for smoother skin. This man has already shaved this morning and now he's taking the Braun Challenge with the revolutionary Braun Flex Control. Quite a nice sensation, actually. We wanted to see how the pivoting head and twin foils followed the contours of his face for a really close shave. I think with it having a double two heads on it, you, you feel as though you're getting shaved twice, if you like. Then we checked how much the brawn had taken off. Very impressed, very impressed. Once you take the brawn challenge, we think you'll agree you haven't shaved till you've shaved with a brawn. Go on, keep moving. Come on. And don't run! Come on, then. Morning. Morning, children. Are they to you? For me? Oh, thanks ever so much. It's all right. Magic moments are only found in Quality Street. Archie's new idea puts Nick in a good mood in Emmerdale, which continues this evening on TVS at 7 o'clock. First, though, we join Bob Holness for Tuesday evening's edition of Blockbusters.